Shalom Israel, it's Kazawan, and the name of this video is, Should We Accept the Apocrypha? I'm doing this video because many people have asked me this question, and the answer is, yes, we should. Now, many people reject the Apocrypha because they claim that it teaches false doctrine. So I want to deal with the false doctrine argument in this video. This is Proverbs chapter 30 and verse 5. It says, Every word of the Most High is pure. So we see that the word of the Most High is pure. So let's compare the Apocrypha and the Bible to see if they both teach the same thing. And if they do, then the words of the Apocrypha are pure also. Now, when it comes to the argument that the Apocrypha teaches false doctrine, there's four main arguments that I want to address. The first argument is that the Apocrypha teaches that you can earn your way into heaven by giving money. That's a claim that people make. Let's look at it. This is Tobit chapter 4 and verse 10. It says, Because that alms do deliver from death and suffereth not to come into darkness. So here it says that giving alms delivers you from death. Now let's get another verse. This is Tobit chapter 12 and verse 9. It says, For alms does deliver from death. So based on these two verses, many people condemn the Apocrypha because they say that it teaches that you can earn your way into heaven by giving alms. Now, we know that the Bible does not teach that. So how do we explain these verses? Let's deal with Tobit 4 and 10 first, but we're going to start up at verse 5 to get the context. It says, My son, be mindful of the Lord our God all thy days. And let not thy will be set to sin or to transgress his commandments. Watch this. Do uprightly all thy life long and follow not the ways of unrighteousness. Now, if Tobit believed that you could earn your way into heaven by giving alms, why would he be teaching his son not to be unrighteous? Why tell him to do uprightly all his life if he could just give away alms and earn salvation? Obviously, that's not what Tobit taught or believed. Verse 6, it says, For if thou deal truly, thy doings shall prosperously succeed to thee and to all them that live justly. Notice again that Tobit is teaching to live a just life. Verse 7, watch this, it says, Give alms of thy substance. So Tobit is teaching that it's good to give. It says, And when thou givest alms, let not thine eye be envious. Meaning, when you give, don't look at what you gave and think about what you could have done with it. Give it away cheerfully. It says, Neither turn thy face from any poor, and the face of the Most High shall not be turned away from thee. So Tobit said, Help out your brothers and your sisters in the truth, if you can. Verse 8, it says, If thou hast abundance, give alms accordingly. Meaning, if you have a lot to give, then give a lot. It says, If thou have but a little, be not afraid to give according to that little. In other words, you give whatever portion that you're able to give. Why? Verse 9, it says, For thou layest up a good treasure for thyself against the day of necessity. In other words, when you give to your brothers and sisters, the Most High becomes generous towards you because of your generosity towards others. When you're willing to give of your substance, rather it be food, clothing, shelter, even finances, 
When you do that, you build up favor with the Most High, which He releases for you when you find yourself in a time of need. This is what Tobit is talking about. Now, with that context, let's read verse 10. It says, Because that alms do deliver from death, and suffereth not to come into darkness. Now, is Tobit saying that you can earn your way into the kingdom by giving alms? No. He's saying that when a person is willing to help others with his substance, the Most High will show favor to that person and deliver him from hard times and even death. So this is not about buying your way into heaven. This is about being a righteous person and obtaining favor from the Most High through your generosity. Verse 11, it says, For alms is a good gift unto all that give it in the sight of the Most High. Why? Because the Most High rewards those who express their love through their actions. Watch, this is Matthew 6 and 3. This is Shai talking. It says, But when thou doest alms, let not thy left hand know what thy right hand doeth. In other words, don't broadcast the good that you do when you give something away. Don't run around telling everybody, I gave this and I gave that. Just give what you're going to give. Why? Verse 4, it says, that thine alms may be in secret. Watch this. And thy father which seeth in secret himself shall reward thee openly. This is what Tobit was talking about. The Most High will give you favor when you give favors to others. So that's the first one. Now let's go to Tobit chapter 12 and verse 9. It says, For alms does deliver from death. We just broke that down and explained it. It says, and shall purge away all sin. It goes on to say, those that exercise alms, watch this, and righteousness shall be filled with life. So it's not just giving alms, it's living a righteous life. And in order to live a righteous life, you have to turn away from your wickedness. So Tobit is not saying that you can somehow give enough away to earn your place in the kingdom. Again, we have to look at the context of what's being said. Let's go up to verse 8. It says, Prayer is good with fasting and alms and righteousness. Clearly, Tobit is not teaching to just depend on alms for salvation. He mentioned prayer, fasting, alms, and righteousness. It says, A little with righteousness is better than much with unrighteousness. Again, Tobit is teaching to live righteously. It says, It is better to give alms than to lay up gold. Now, Tobit is not teaching a new doctrine. We see the same thing written in the book of Matthew. This is Matthew chapter 6 and verse 19. This is Yahweh Shai talking. It says, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust does corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. That's exactly what Tobit said. Tobit said it's better to give alms than to lay up gold. Verse 20. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust does corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. Now, what's one of the ways that you lay up treasures for yourself in heaven? By giving alms to your people. Why? Because again, when the Most High sees you being generous, He gives favor to you. So that is not a false doctrine. The Standard Bible teaches the same thing. Now, the next argument against the Apocrypha is that it teaches that money 
can be given as a sin offering to the Most High. Let's look at it. This is 2 Maccabees chapter 12 and verse 43. It says, And when he had made a gathering throughout the company to the sum of 2,000 drachms of silver, here it is, he sent it to Jerusalem to offer a sin offering doing therein very well and honestly, in that he was mindful of the resurrection. So we see here that money was collected and that it was sent to Jerusalem to offer as a sin offering. Now, we know that during this time, you had to offer animal sacrifice as a sin offering. So people who are against the Apocrypha use this verse to say that it's teaching a false doctrine of giving money as a sin offering. The problem, like always, is that people are misunderstanding what this verse is actually saying. Let's read it again. 2 Maccabees chapter 12 and verse 43. It says, And when he had made a gathering throughout the company to the sum of 2,000 drachms of silver, that's money, it says, he sent it to Jerusalem to offer a sin offering, doing therein very well and honestly, and that he was mindful of the resurrection. So again, we see that money was collected and that it was sent to Jerusalem to offer a sin offering. Now, before we explain this, Let's go to Exodus chapter 30 and verse 11 to see if we can find the same thing. This is Exodus chapter 30 and verse 11. It says, And Yahweh spake unto Moses, saying, Verse 12, When thou takest the sum of the children of Israel after their number, watch this, then shall they give every man a ransom for his soul unto Yahweh when thou numberest them, that there may be no plague among them when thou numberest them. So the Most High said that every man had to give a ransom for his soul. That's a sin offering. Now let's see what they gave. Verse 13. This they shall give, every one that passeth among them that are numbered, here it is. Half a shekel after the shekel of the sanctuary. A shekel is 20 garas. It says, And half shekel shall be the offering of Yahweh. Now, this looks just like the same thing that we read in the Apocrypha. Let's keep reading. Verse 14. Everyone that passeth among them that are numbered from 20 years old and above, shall give an offering unto Yahweh. Verse 15, The rich shall not give more, and the poor shall not give less than half a shekel, when they give an offering unto Yahweh. Now, why are they given this offering? It says, To make an atonement for your souls. So here we see that money was given for the purpose of atonement. But here is where the misunderstanding comes in. Verse 16. And thou shalt take the atonement money of the children of Israel and do what? It says, and shall appoint it for the service of the tabernacle of the congregation that it may be a memorial unto the children of Israel before Yahweh, here it is, to make an atonement for your souls. You see? So what did they do with this atonement money that was collected? They used the money for the services of the tabernacle. In other words, they used the money to buy the things necessary for the tabernacle to run. They didn't burn the money on the altar as a sin offering. They used the money to keep the tabernacle running, which allowed the priest to offer animal sacrifice. And that's what the Apocrypha is talking about. 
They collected money to send to Jerusalem for the upkeep of the tabernacle, which then allowed the required sacrifices to be made. So no, the Apocrypha is not teaching a false doctrine. Now, the next argument is that the Apocrypha promotes the ideal of purgatory or the practice of praying for the dead. Let's look at it. This is 2 Maccabees chapter 12 and verse 43 again. It says, And when he had made a gathering throughout the company of the sum of 2,000 drachms of silver, he sent it to Jerusalem to offer a sin offering, doing therein very well and honestly, watch this, in that he was mindful of the resurrection. So this particular brother whose name was Judas, he believed in the resurrection. Verse 44. For if he had not hoped that they that were slain should have risen again, here it is, it had been superfluous and vain to pray for the dead. So the problem that people have here is that it says that this man was praying for the dead. So what's going on here? Well, the point being made in this verse is that this brother Judas definitely believed in the resurrection because if he didn't, it would have been pointless and vain for him to pray for the dead at all. Now, the problem, of course, is that the Bible does not teach that we should be praying for the dead. So why is it mentioned in the Apocrypha? The answer is this. Just like the Standard Bible, the Apocrypha does not hide the bad stuff that we did. It tells you the good and the bad. When you go into the history during this time, you find that it was common amongst our people to pray for those that died. Even though that's wrong, our people was doing it. Now, why did they do it? Because they didn't have the full understanding of how the resurrection was going to happen. Remember, even later on, during the time of Yahweh Shai, the Sadducees was teaching that there was no resurrection. Watch. This is Matthew chapter 22 and verse 23. It says, The same day came to him the Sadducees. Watch this. Which say that there is no resurrection. And asked him. See that? So even during the time of Yahweh Shai, there were groups teaching that there was no resurrection. And that's why you see Paul breaking down the resurrection in his writings. Now, the brother Judas in the Apocrypha, he believed in the resurrection, but he didn't have the proper understanding of how it was going to take place. So a lot of people during that time, they had good intentions when they prayed for the dead, but they didn't know they were in error. They thought that by praying for the dead, it would increase their chances of rising up in the resurrection. Again, that's why Paul had to give the proper understanding in his writings. This is 1 Thessalonians 4 and 13. It says, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. Notice what Paul said. He said, I don't want you to be confused about what's going to happen to those that died. That shows you that some people didn't understand exactly how the resurrection was going to take place. It says that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. Verse 14. For if we believe that Yahweh Shai died and rose again. Even so them also which sleep in Yahweh Shai will the Most High bring with him. So Paul said, don't worry about those who died in the truth because they're going to rise again. So again, this shows you that there were people who did not have clarity on the resurrection issue. Now, let's go back to 2 Maccabees 12 and 44. It says, For if he had not hoped that they that were slain should have risen again, it had been superfluous and vain to pray for the dead. 
So again, this brother Judas believed in the resurrection and he prayed for the dead because he thought he was helping their cause. Verse 45, it says, And also in that he perceived that there was great favor laid up for those that died godly. It says, It was an holy and good thought, meaning he was right in his thinking as far as the reward waiting for the righteous. He was right about that. It says, Whereupon he made a reconciliation for the dead that they might be delivered from sin. So this brother Judas prayed out of the concern for those who died in the faith. He was trying to cover any mistakes they might have made during their lifetime. Now, does that make what he was doing right as far as praying for the dead? No, but it doesn't say that what he was doing was right. This is just a record of what he and others during that time was doing. They didn't have the proper understanding. Now, watch this. If the Apocrypha is wicked for having this story in it, then that would make the Standard Bible wicked too. Why? This is 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 29. It says, Else, what shall they do, watch this, which are baptized for the dead? If the dead rise not at all, why are they then baptized for the dead? So here we see Paul talking about people who are being baptized for the dead. Now we know that the Bible does not promote this practice, but yet we see Paul talking about it. So does that make the Bible wicked also because Paul is talking about this subject? No. Paul is addressing a particular practice that was happening during his time. There were people who believed that they could get baptized in the place of other people who had died outside of the truth. There was all types of beliefs around and they had to be addressed. So Paul is using their own thinking against them. He said, look, if the dead don't rise like you guys say, then why are you getting baptized for the dead? You see, Paul is not teaching that it's right to get baptized for the dead, just like the Apocrypha is not teaching that it's right to pray for the dead. Both subjects are being addressed because these are beliefs that our people had. So again, the Apocrypha is not teaching false doctrine. Now, the next argument against the Apocrypha is that it promotes the use of magic. Let's look at it. This is Tobit chapter 6 and verse 1. It says, And as they went on their journey, they came in the evening to the river Tigris, and they lodged there. Verse 2. And when the young man went down to wash himself, a fish leaped out of the river and would have devoured him. Verse 3. Then the angel said unto him, Take the fish. And the young man laid hold of the fish and drew it to land. Verse 4. To whom the angel said, Open the fish, watch this, and take the heart and the liver and the gall and put them up safely. So the angel told Tobias to take the heart, the liver, and the gall of the fish and to put it in a safe place. Verse 5. So the young man did as the angel commanded him, and when they had roasted the fish, they did eat it. Then they both went on their way till they drew near to Ecbatane. Verse 6. Then the young man said to the angel, Brother Azarias, to what use is the heart and the liver and the gall of the fish? So Tobias asked the angel, what are we going to use the heart, the liver, and the gall for? Verse 7. And he said unto him, here it is, touching the heart and the liver, if a devil or an evil spirit troubleth any, we must make a smoke thereof before the man or the woman, and the party shall be no more vexed. Now, the gall of the fish wasn't mentioned yet. 
This is just dealing with the heart and the liver. The angel told Tobias to take the heart and the liver of the fish and to make a smoke for the purpose of running off evil spirits. So, people against the Apocrypha say that this verse promotes some type of magic. They claim nothing like this is found in the Standard Bible. But is this actually talking about magic? No. What is this smoke that's mentioned? Let's jump down to verse 16. It says, And when thou shalt come into the marriage chamber, thou shalt take the ashes of perfume and shall lay upon them some of the heart and liver of the fish and shall make a smoke with it. So now we see that the heart and the liver of the fish was combined into a perfume. And when you burn the perfume, it was smoke. So we know that this smoke had a particular smell to it, which is why it's called a perfume. Verse 17. And the devil shall smell it and flee away and never come again any more. Now, why would the evil spirit smell this smoky perfume and run away? Is it because of some type of magic? No. This is Exodus chapter 30 and verse 37. It says, And as for the perfume which thou shalt make, so here we see perfume being made in the book of Exodus, it says, Ye shall not make to yourselves according to the composition thereof. Watch this. It shall be unto thee holy for Yahweh. So this perfume that was made was holy unto the Most High. Now let's look up the word perfume in this verse. Here it is. So we see that the word perfume in this verse is the Hebrew word kwatarath. And when you go down to the outline of biblical usage, it says, incense, smoke. So this perfume was made of a combination of different contents and it was burned as incense, and the smoke had a sweet odor. Watch. It says, odor of burning, sacrifice. Hold on. So perfume is also the smoke that comes from the burning of a sacrifice. Letter A says, sweet smoke of sacrifice. So now we understand that the smoke from a sacrifice is considered a perfume to the Most High. That's why letter B says, incense, and letter C says, perfume. Now that we understand that, this is Exodus chapter 29 and verse 13. It says, And thou shalt take all the fat that covereth the inwards, watch this, and the call, that is above the liver. In other words, that's the lobe of the liver. It says, and the two kidneys and the fat that is upon them. Watch this. And burn them upon the altar. So here we see the liver being burned on the altar. The liver, the kidneys, these are all organs. The heart is an organ the deepest part of the body. All these parts were offered on the altar as a sacrifice. And the smoke from these parts, as we read, creates a perfume that the Most High smells. So now that we understand that, let's go to Tobit chapter 8 and verse 1 to see what happened with the perfumed smoke. This is Tobit chapter 8 and verse 1. It says, and when they had supped, they brought Tobias in unto her. Verse 2. And as he went, he remembered the words of Raphael and took the ashes of the perfumes and put the heart and the liver of the fish thereupon and made a smoke therewith. What was Tobit doing? He was offering up a sacrifice to the Most High. He burned up the contents, which caused a smoke or perfume. 
Verse 3, it says, The witch smell, when the evil spirit has smelled, he fled into the utmost parts of Egypt, and the angel bound him. Now, why did the evil spirit run when he smelled the smoke? Because he knew it was a sacrifice to the Most High. So Tobias was not doing magic. He was given a sacrifice to the Most High. This is Philippians chapter 4 and verse 18. It says, But I have all and abound. I am full, having received of Epaphroditus the things which were sent from you. Here it is. An odor of a sweet smell. Watch this. A sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing to the Most High. So again, Tobias was not doing magic. It was a sacrifice. And the smell of the sacrifice was pleasing to the Most High. And when the evil spirit smelled it, he fled away. Now, somebody might say, well, spirits can't smell. So let's see. This is Amos 5 and 21. This is the Most High talking. It says, I hate, I despise your feast days. Now, what did Israel have to do during the feast days? We had to burn sacrifices. It says, And I will not smell in your solemn assemblies. So the Most High said, I'm not going to smell your sacrifices. What does that mean? That means that he has the ability to smell. So if the Most High being the chief spirit can smell, so can the evil spirits that he created. Now, we dealt with the heart and the liver of the fish, but what about the gall that Tobias took out of the fish? Let's go back to Tobit 6 and pick it up at verse 8. It says, As for the gall, it is good to anoint a man that have whiteness in his eyes, and he shall be healed. What does it mean to have whiteness in your eyes? It means that this man was blind. So the angel told Tobias that the gall of the fish could be used to heal the eyes. Now, when you read the whole story, you find out that Tobias' father, Tobit, had went blind. So let's see what Tobias did with the gall of the fish. This is Tobit 11 and 7. It says, Then said Raphael, I know, Tobias, that thy father will open his eyes. Verse 8. Therefore, anoint thou his eyes with the gall, and being pricked therewith, he shall rub. Watch this. And the whiteness shall fall away, and he shall see thee. Now, some people have a problem with this story. But even today, many people use fish oil to improve their eyesight. So why is this story so hard to believe? In fact, this is not even close to some of the things we read in the Standard Bible. For example, this is John 9 and 1. It says, And as Jehoshaphat passed by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth. So Jehoshaphat is out, and he sees a man that's blind. Let's jump down to verse 5. This is Jehoshaphat talking. It says, As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Verse 6. When he had thus spoken, here it is, he spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle. So Yahawashai spit on the ground to make mud. It says, And he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. Now watch this, verse 7. And said unto him, Go, Wash in the pool of Siloam, which is by interpretation sent. It says, He went his way, therefore, and washed, here it is, and came seeing. So this man was able to see after Yahawashai spit on the ground and made a mud compound to put on his eyes. Now, the people who come against the Apocrypha, they don't have any problem with this story. Yahawashai can use his spit to heal blindness. 
And that's believable. But using the gall of a fish to make oil to heal blindness is somehow unbelievable. That just shows you the bias of people against the Apocrypha. Both stories are amazing, but you reject the Apocrypha story because you've been taught that the book is false. However, as we just saw, the book is not false. The problems that people have with the Apocrypha is because they don't have the understanding of what it's talking about. The Apocrypha lines up with the Bible through the precepts. And the only reason to reject it is a lack of understanding. Now, there's a lot of other things we could talk about and cover, but I just wanted to deal with the false doctrine aspect. Also, I want to be clear. The Apocrypha that I'm talking about is the authorized King James Version Apocrypha. I'm not talking about the annotated version Apocrypha (laughs) with those extra verses added. I'm talking about the King James Authorized Version, which includes 1st Esdras, 2nd Esdras, Tobit, Judith, the rest of Esther, the Wisdom of Solomon, Ecclesiasticus, Baruch, the Song of the Three Holy Children, the History of Susanna, Bell and the Dragon, the Prayer of Manassas, 1st Maccabees, and 2nd Maccabees. Now, if I didn't mention a particular book, that's because I'm not talking about that book. Those books that I just mentioned make up the Apocrypha that I'm talking about in this video. Here's something you can look up for yourself. If you know anything about the Septuagint, which is the Hebrew scriptures translated into the Greek, the Apocrypha was in the Septuagint. And the Septuagint is dated back to 285 B.C., meaning before Yahweh Shai was born, the Apocrypha was already included in the Septuagint. Also, when you go into the Wycliffe Bible, 1382 A.D., the Apocrypha was there. The Coverdale Bible, 1535, the Apocrypha was there. The Great Bible, 1539. The Apocrypha was there. The Geneva Bible, 1560. The Apocrypha was there. The Bishop's Bible, 1568. The Apocrypha was there. The Douay Rhymes Bible, 1609. The Apocrypha was there. And the King James 1611 Bible, the Apocrypha was there. In fact, if you buy a King James 1611 Bible right now, you will see the Apocrypha in it. Not to mention the Zurich Bible, 1530, the French Olivetan Bible, 1535, the German Luther Bible, 1545, and many others. The Apocrypha has always been a part of the Bible until the 1800s when it was taken out. You can look that up for yourself to verify it. So should we accept the Apocrypha? Yes. Now, before I end this video, please be advised, all general comments are accepted. If you disagree with something that I say, you have that right. However, if you attack me on a personal level outside of the scriptures and resort to name calling and childish unspiritual behavior, your comment will be erased and you will be blocked. Also, if you disagree with something that I teach, that's fine. You have the right to comment about it. But if you make a comment in disagreement and you don't use scriptures to support what you're saying, I won't block you, but your comment will be erased because I deal with scriptures, not opinions. Now, to the sincere Israelites who watch my videos, I'm not talking to y'all. I appreciate you guys for taking the time out to watch and listen. But I'm talking to these immature, non-spiritual trolls who always have something to say. But when you go to their page, nine times out of ten, they don't have one single video teaching anything. But yet, they want to come on my page and teach in the comment section. I'm not allowing that anymore. So, with that being said... As always, I hope that somebody got some understanding from this video. 
And with that, I say, Shalom.